and welcome to the third day of the Imaginative Film and Media Arts Festival. We are halfway through, but, but nearly not done. My name is Nikki Little, the Artistic Director, and joining me this evening is Claudia. I mean, my name is Claudia Skunk, Corporate Partner and Donor Initiatives Lead here at Imaginative. For those that may not know us, Imaginative is the world's largest indigenous festival showcasing film, video, audio, and digital and interactive media made by indigenous screen content creators. This year, we are presenting compelling and distinctive works from over 150 indigenous creators from Turtle Island and around the globe, reflecting the diversity of 98 different nations and illustrating the dynamic vitality of indigenous arts, perspectives, and cultures in contemporary media art. Tonight, you'll have the opportunity to witness further the fluidity of indigenous storytelling through the IN 2020 exhibitions program. These exhibitions bring forward notions of sovereignty in relation to indigenous bodies, land, kinship, and continuums. During the art crawl, we will be giving away our fabulous book from this year's festival, and we will be choosing the recipient through the comments section of the live stream. So be sure to tell us your thoughts. Miigwech to our artists and our curators for collaborating with us this year. We're so thrilled to be sharing this space with you all. And we're happy to partner with Vicki and Rebecca at, at, at A Space Gallery again for Samoan history, screens, and intimacies. Dr. Leili Ashragi curated the, a first world survey exhibition of interdisciplinary Samoan video art and short film classics featuring rarely seen works from 1995 to 2013. I'm so happy that Leili will introduce the exhibition and we will see clips from the six works in the show. Please some, also spend some time in our digital space, which is on the festival website to see the works in its total. Thank you to A Space for continuing to collaborate with us and for Neo Taro for supporting this exhibition. The next exhibition is actually an imaginative project featuring Thurza Cuthand called Medicine and Magic, curated by Ariel Smith. Cuthand delves into the impact and traces of ancestral memories through two specific instances in her family history separated by time and geography. Thurza will continue, will continue to introduce the piece, which is actually intended to be a two-channel installation. Miigwech to the Ontario Arts Council, VTAPE, and Neotero for supporting medicines, medicine and magic. Then the next stop is going to be looking at kinship and connectivity over fast distances and Constellations of Kin, a three-person group exhibition curated by Eli Hurdle. We're gonna see a lovely conversation between the curator and the artists who, who are speaking to the inspiration behind the works. We will see documentation and clips from the exhibition, which again is online in the digital space. Constellations of Kin presented by Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Center's Poetic Justice Project is made possible with the generous funding from the C Canada Council for the Arts and by Neo Taro. And finally, our last stop, we're going to hear about the profound influence of kinship networks to uplift resilience by Tara, Tanya Lukland Linklater at Trinity Square Video. Thank you to Trinity Square Video for co-presenting this exhibition and Achi Miigwech again to Nia Taro for supporting all of our exhibitions this year. Join us after the art crawl where we will be announcing three giveaway winners. Enjoy the show. <laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to our annual art crawl. My name is Nikki Little and I'm the Artistic Director at Imaginative. We'll be stopping at four galleries this evening and connecting with artists and curators at each one. So in Histories, Screens and in Intimacies is an exhibition at A Space Gallery investigating the practices of Samoan artists and filmmakers engaging with bodies, sexualities, kinship, cultural knowledge and futurities. It includes work from seven Samoan artists and is curated by Dr. Leuli Ishragi.
Elene i tu la avea i lo leo e faima fufonga ta moli moli le fa la poto potonga o tanga tanu o Toronto e fa talo fa atu ma fa felo a i atu le pa i malama malo le aso ta to malo fa o ala o alongia ai mai se le pa i malama malo o le nei ta yao i fanua o tanga tanu o wenda ha dona shore nei ma anishnabe o la o nganu u o mishisagi malo le soifua malo le soifu manuia. To the Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Anishinaabe, including Mishisagi, whose jurisdiction over Toronto I recognize, I am a grateful visitor, treading with humility and respect in your territories, bringing my Samoan ancestors' teachings of good conduct and peace to this gathering. Good health to you all. Drawn into a non-linear temporality as Siapo Viliata, animated bark cloths, the works within this exhibition, Samoan histories, screens, and intimacies, presented at A Space Gallery and online in Imaginative's art crawl, signal various purposes, including the keeping of cultural memory, innovating artistic practices, and strengthening international indigenous visual arts research. This pandemic is sadly only the latest of many that have continually reduced Samoan and other indigenous communities in swift, painful moments of mass death and cultural loss since the 1700s. My hope in curating this exhibition is that one day the barriers to indigenous visual, spoken, sensual, and gestural languages cease to impact on cultural transmission, belonging, and health so deeply and enduringly, that we may come together and understand each other despite all of the colonial borders that crisscross our minds and our bodies and our territories. The Ngangana Samo word sui and its extension suinga denote changes, shifts, ever-shifting flowing existence, unlike Western fixed positions and knowledges. This suinga enables us to see each other over the horizon, through the haze of fake news, climate inaction, political collusion, and to a place where the proverb e pala ma'a aile pala upu rings true. Even stones erode away, but words will never decay. Thank you.
My name is Sinalela, and this is my movie. I live in Samoa by a pool. Above the pool on the hillside is my mother's grave. My father married again into a poor but important family. My stepmother was a queen and an ogre. My stepsisters, Melele and Graham, were queens too. Everyone was a queen but me. I was just an ex-rugby player consigned to household duties. Every day at the sink, I dreamed of construction workers and taxi drivers and traveled to distant places like San Francisco, California, to a secret hut made of the cut stems from floral shops filled with construction workers and taxi drivers. Every time I approached the secret hut in my dreams, I was rudely called back by my stepmother, the queen and ogre, to perform impossible tasks. My stepsisters had lives very different from my own. My stepsister Graham was a businesswoman. She spent all day working for the American Samoa government. I'm not sure what she did, but it had something to do with missile shipments to Kwajalein. She also owned a sewing shop. My other sister, Mea Lele, managed a government-owned hotel. She had managed to get it named the worst tourist destination in the world, which is a good thing, because who wants tourists? They expect you to give them the best beaches, the best views, the best food, the best girls so our kids can learn to sell ulas. My mother. She sent me here from Samoa to live with my aunt in Otara. <laughs> For my education. I wore the fa'a la la Attitude, ma'am. Hey, father, have it. We're gonna sit with the reverend today. Dino, take those stupid sunglasses off. You're not going to the disco. Wait, Noah. Hey, oh, fancy on him. Probably still asleep. Hi. <laughs> and where do you think you are going looking like that? Ah, yeah. Just sitting anywhere near me, freak. Go fair, fair, see on him. Hey, give a leer. You can't go to look when and look like a. Ah. Fa, fa, fa. So we eat. I already told you. What's wrong with your head, ah? Uh? You are not in Siomo anymore. You are in Otara. Wait, Loa. Your mother sent you because she doesn't want you to look like this. You are lucky your uncle's already gone, ah? Uh? Yeah, no for. You do the bonga, yeah? You stay, you do the lunch. We're late. Savali. Medicine and Magic is a dual channel video installation by Thurza Cuthan, curated by Ariel Smith. Cuthan pulls from her own familiar history to connect two separate incidences which occurred over 100 years and 6,000 kilometers apart. Hi, thanks for coming to see my video um, installation, Medicine and Magic. It's been a long process of trying to figure out how to talk about uh, traditional medicines and also my Scottish ancestry. Um, I was doing some research and was discovering things about Scottish witchcraft trials, which were um, the most, Scotland was had the most witchcraft trials in Europe, so um, there's a database and I was looking up um, who I could be related to and I found, I found some people. Um, and then medicine, um, the, the 
The story about my great great grandfather that was a story in a book by Fine Day um, based on um, what happened after the Battle of Cut Knife Hill when my great grandfather great great grandfather who was the war chief was injured um, leading the battle. Um, so I hope you enjoy it. Thanks.
Constellations of Kin, curated by Eli Hurdle, feature works by Alyssa Harkins, Nicole Nyhard, and Wes Harmon at the Canadian Filmmaker Distribution Centre, and engages with the concept of what kinship means to each artist and how the care, connection, and safety within these systems guide them in imagining their futures. So my name is Eli Hurdle. Uh, I'm an artist and curator of Naheo or Cree and European ancestry, living and working on the lands of the Lekwungen people in so-called Victoria, BC. Uh, before I proceed, I want to acknowledge the partnership between the Canadian Filmmakers Distribution Centre and the Imaginative Film Festival with the support of the Canada Council for the Arts, uh, which has made this exhibition possible. So as we're art crawling virtually this evening, I'm reminded of the electric energy I felt two years ago while attending the Imaginative Film Festival, especially during the evening of the art crawl. Uh, I hope that these videos can replicate in some way how inspiring that was for me and allow all of the artists that are participating in the festival this year to share their work in meaningful ways. In an ideal world, we would all be in Toronto this week, installing the work in the show and enjoying the film festival together. But the new world we find ourselves in has changed so much for so many of us. I know that for myself, this year has been a time for deeper reflection about the relationships and kinship, kinship connections in my own life. Um, so in that way, I'm hopeful that the themes and work within this exhibition have a resonance that we couldn't have anticipated last year. When I started thinking about this exhibition last fall, I was in the midst of researching and creating work about Naheo star knowledge and stories about constellation systems. Um, I was considering the artists and people in my life that I've connected deeply with, that guide and inspire my own way of walking through the world, and invited these three artists to join in the conversation and contribute work that speaks to the relationships and kinship connections in their own lives. So at this point, I'd like to invite each of the artists to introduce themselves. And at that point, we can kind of just flow into a conversation about the different uh, work that they contributed to the exhibition. Yate Nicole Neidhart, Yanashia Kia Ani Meshle, Bilagana Bashish Chin, Do Sinajini Dashiche, Do Bilagana Dashanala. Hi, my name is Nicole Neidhart. Um, I'm Navajo or Dana, as we like to call ourselves. Um, my family comes from Round Rock, Arizona, um, but I grew up on Tewa territory in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I'm currently going to school at OCAD University in Toronto for my Master of Fine Arts. And uh, yeah, my practice is mostly in um, visual arts practice. And I've been doing a lot of work with Indigenous futurisms lately and in that storytelling uh, and in that aesthetics and really thinking about how all of those can intertwine in my installation work. So yeah, nice to be here this morning. Hari Tsutnzen, my name is Wes Harmon and I am currently on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil um, I've been living here for the last 10 years or so. Um, and in those 10 years, I think uh, there have been a lot of different forms of kinship that have taken up just as someone who's living away from their territories and kind of the way that cities pull together pull together our lives in interesting ways. Um, and I'm very grateful to be able to do that on this land and have that be held in that way. Um, what can I say about myself? <laughs> Maybe I should have read a bio. Uh, no, I'm an artist and I'm a curator. Um, I work at Grunt Gallery, um, helping produce shows there. Uh, I also run a project called Together Apart, which current, 
current iteration is a series of zines. Um, if you're interested in those, let me know. Um, yeah, then apart from that, uh, I'll talk more about my work when I'm talking about the piece that I made for the show. Uh, hence Che. Uh, I'm Elisa Harkins. Um, I'm Cherokee, Muscogee Creek, and Japanese. I'm Bear Clan, and my tribal town is Kawita. I currently live in Tulsa, which is now uh, on the lands of the Muscogee Creek Reservation. Um, I have a few different practices, um, but all of them sort of uh, are inspired by language and going to language classes at um, the Muscogee Creek Community Center. Um, I sing in Cherokee and Muscogee Creek, and I have a prodigistic musical concert uh, with a, a disco diva. <laughs> And um, I also have a project um, that I'm showing for Imaginative called Teach Me a Song. And I'm also a Tulsa Artist Fellow and I was awarded a grant this year to um, host an online concert series called Six Moons. Mado, thank you. I'm interested in hearing each of you talk a little bit about how maybe you had originally um, conceived work for this show and how that's changed over this year with everything that's been going on. And um, yeah, if that's also changed um, kind of your relationship with this work or the making of this work um, or what it means to you in relationship to this exhibition. Yeah, so uh, the piece that I created for the show is my Dina Basket Portal. And um, it's actually a piece that I created um, about a year ago, and I just felt like it really fit with all of the themes of the exhibition. Um, but basically, to kind of just give a brief, like, I don't know, summary of like what the installation is, um, it's a recreation and uh, kind of like a transformation of a Diné ceremonial basket. And it's made of mirror mylar, sand, and light. So it's actually like an installation um, that hangs in space in a room um, with light that kind of creates these beautiful patterns out of the stencils that I cut in the walls of the portal. Um, and when I think about the portal, like I really think about it as a space of like a pocket of Diné time, uh, like Diné story and like a Diné world. Um, and so, I mean, ideally with the installation, you actually engage with it physically um, and you step into it and you can kind of experience this moment of like relationality with kind of Diné thought and worlds. Um, because the walls of the portal have like depictions of Dineta, which is like the Navajo homeland. So it's really like you're kind of stepping into this visual kind of experience of all of these kinship relations that are connected to my home territory. And I think it's just really interesting to translate that to a virtual world. Um, the way that I've kind of conceptualize this is to do a 360 video because um, I felt like that was the most kind of embodied way you could still engage with the installation online. So um, in a 360 video, you know, you can look down to see the sand that you would be standing on virtually, um, which is sand from my home territory. So I'm actually bringing in like the earth to the room. Um, and you can kind of like see that when you're in the installation, you can look around at the walls and like look above you. So it should be a fairly immersive experience, but um, it was kind of an interesting challenge to like turn an installation into a, a virtual experience. The work that I've made for this particular um, online exhibition is uh, 
there was the impulse to kind of like be like animation again. Um, but after spending like a week and a half making eight seconds worth of video, I realized I had to <laughs> re-strategize. Um, so what I ended up settling on is a essentially a performance video where I'm playing a fictional game called Opening Night. And the game is set up like a social simulation or a dating sim style of game. Um, <clears throat> so if you haven't played those before, basically what happens is you have some kind of character. It's sort of like an RPG. Um, there's usually not any animation in it or any like moving components. It's sort of like um, the person you're playing is presented with options and then those options can affect different options in the future. And it's like goal oriented and it's a very contained world, but it's meant to kind of replicate certain types of uh, experiences that we have in real life. Um, so in this case, the opening night, the premise of the game is that you are at a art exhibition slash, slash concert. Uh, your goals in the game are to have like five meaningful conversations, um, to listen to some of the music, hopefully to look at at least one piece of artwork and to not pee your pants. So <laughs> Um, that's kind of like the parameters that I've built this game in. It'd be really fun to actually make this game. Um, for the video, it is all like, um, I will be behaving as though this is a game that is real and works, um, but it's literally scripted and like everything I have drawn in it is, yeah, very specific to just that performance video. But if anyone wants to fund me making this game in the future, <laughs> I think it would be hilarious. All right, mission one, a beverage. But wait, you recognize the bartender. This could be your first conversation of the night. You say hello or just order your drink. Uh, I mean, we just got here. We may as well say hello. Like, there's probably not a lot of people here. Uh, oh, what a babe. Uh, oh, hi, Wes. Yeah, you can say hi. Uh, it's been a while. You have art in the show, right? First drinks free. What have you been up to? You give them the goss, goss, <laughs> the goss, the gossling. Uh, you give them the gosh honest truth. You're feeling a little wild, like a cage rat. You ask them how they're doing if they submitted art to the show. Um, okay, like we can ask each other how we're doing forever. So let's like ask an actual question. Oh, I did. I didn't get it. Well, whoops. Uh, I want to keep going for it. Uh, say that you're sure that they'll get it next time. Politely excuse yourself. Ask them what they submitted. Offer pointers. Okay, no, that's just rude. Like, I would never... No, they're at work. Um, we will just politely excuse ourselves. Yeah, I was kind of late for the deadline anyway, so I get it. Have fun tonight. See, perfect. Perfectly fine. Uh, a lot of the Teach Me a Song, uh, for Teach Me a Song, uh, a lot of the work is... Um, uh, was ideally to go travel and also to bring people here um, to uh, do song exchanging. Um, but uh, it seems like that's not exactly possible, um, except I am planning to go to uh, Florida um, to um, visit the Seminole tribe to, um, to do some song trading. But yeah, the project... Um, is based on um, yeah uh, trading songs with people basically. So um, I will sing a Muscogee Creek hymn, and then someone can uh, teach me a song, uh, trade a song back, and I um, shoot video of it, and then I make a shawl for the song, um, and. Uh, yeah, it's been really amazing. All the different songs um, that I've been uh, hearing. Uh, there's like, there's the AIM song. There's a version of the AIM song. It's um, an Osage elder singing it and um, it's much slower and uh, lower than um, maybe some people have heard it. Um, more like a Southern style of singing. And um, my language teacher, 
uh, who's a minister, he uh, wrote uh, an instrumental on guitar and then asked me to um, shake uh, my shells, my lojas, which are we use in stomp dance. And um, so I'm making the beat and he's playing the guitar. <laughs> and um, uh, Eli Hurdle uh, traded a song with me. Uh, it's a Dakota prayer song and uh, he's playing hand drum. And then um, uh, Cheyenne Rain Legrand, she uh, sings a song that her mother uh, created years ago, which I find really interesting because um, her mother's uh, practice is similar to mine where um, like I write songs in order to preserve Cherokee and Muscogee Creek language and also to um, sort of learn the language also while I am writing the songs. And um, so her mother uh, was writing these sort of like um, contemporary songs in Cree. And um, so uh, Cheyenne is, sings this song called Thunderhawks Cry Too. Um, and it's, it's really beautiful. <laughs> Thank you all for sharing so much so eloquently um, I think we have everything that we need um, if anybody wants to add anything else so this is the song that I typically trade with people um, it's a Muscogee Creek hymn and it's called this may be the last time we do not know or as bogey das omi skithis goes Es pogi des o mes que te escos. Es pogi des o mes que te escos. Me goza pa que apeyana. Es pogi des o mes. Get these ghosts. Mido, thank you. <laughs> wow. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. This moment, an endurance to the end forever, at Trinity Square Video, is an exhibition shaped in the living room of artist Tanya Lukelin Linklater, an ever shifting space that has held gatherings of Cree families of North Bay and performances of Indigenous women, and now acts as a shared studio space for the artist and her two children. This work showcases a multi-generational discussion of what treaties mean for family and building agency within these histories for future inheritors. Thank you for doing this with me, Tanya. I'm happy to have the opportunity to chat about your work. Uh, for those of you who need a little introduction, this uh, conversation 
is uh, surrounding the exhibition that will be in the space at Trinity Square Video titled This Moment and Endurance to the End Forever. And it'll be in the space from October 9th uh, to November 14th this year. Um, and Tanya, you, you and I have been chatting about this exhibition for years now, uh, I think since about 2018. And we've imagined many different ways of presenting your work within the gallery and it's fluctuated obviously um, throughout the years. But now in the event of the pandemic, um, there has been some shifting perspectives about the context of the exhibition in relation to your existing video work, uh, particularly uh, Treaty is in the Body. And I believe and according to my notebook, uh, back in May, maybe you're chatting about your living room and how it's become a multi-purpose site, a studio visit, gathering place, a backdrop for your video, video work. Um, can you elaborate a bit on this space now and your thoughts about this space and how it's functioning and has continued to function as a site for the transfer in indigenous knowledges and histories? Sure. Well, thank you so much for that introduction and thank you for inviting me and having um, ample conversation over two years in preparation for the exhibition. Um, uh, during the pandemic, there was a bit of a shift, I think, in our thinking about, um, about how the exhibition could unfold. And I was thinking a great deal at that time about the living room, my living room, um, as this space where, um, you know, it's my studio and particularly given the context of the pandemic, I was in close proximity and close relation to my children on a daily basis, more so than perhaps when they were um, babies or small children. Um, and so I was thinking about this shared space, this vibrant space, this space that we occupied all of the time. But also, um, I'm a Lutic. I'm from um, Kodiak Island in southwestern Alaska. And as a child I, and a young person, I grew up in the native village of Port Lyons. And there weren't many places for people to gather. Uh, you know, there's a high school in the tribal building, um, the post office. Uh, sometimes we had a store and sometimes we didn't. Um, and so we often had visitors at our house. So people would come over and we would have tea or coffee and um, a lot of times homemade bread and smoked salmon um, and we would share food and and I did a lot of just listening in because I was young and there would be lots of conversation about the seasons and the tides and the weather, subsistence, you know, hunting and fishing, but also politics um, as my dad was on the tribal council for a time and was also involved in the subsistence, uh, subsistence advocacy in the state of Alaska over many years. And so this was the place that we gathered. This is the place that we were with one another. And I guess that's always been really important for me. Um, but also as I've sort of, you know, grown in my lifetime, I've also entered into other indigenous spaces and there's been discussion over time about the centrality of the home as a space for the transfer of indigenous knowledge. And so in 2017, I undertook a project called The Treaty is in the Body um, and invited Omuskego Cree knowledge holder, Jennifer Wabno, who's from Piwanek, uh, to come to my home and to share knowledge about treaty. Um, her knowledge um, based on teachings and, and knowledge that have been passed down. And she did so within the context of um, a group of women and girls who were here in my living room and learning alongside one another. And I undertook, you know, cultural protocols for that transfer of knowledge or that sharing of knowledge. Um, and then subsequently shot uh, a video here as well, a sister video to that video, um, where I asked Ivani Abin Malo, um, who was also present for the sharing of that knowledge, uh, to investigate the two row wampum uh, physically. And so, um, you know, there are other components of that pro of that project uh, or the that uh, series of projects. Um, but I've been thinking a great deal about how. Um, that was about sharing knowledge, about coming together to be in relation to one another, and that it's very deeply connected to our relatives 
who had this knowledge before us, whether those are our grandmothers, our grandfathers, our aunties, our uncles, or um, our ancestors, and how that's been passed on. But I've also been thinking a great deal about how that knowledge um, needs to be activated um, in the present moment, and also hopefully in the future. And so that's why I was really thinking about asking my children to participate um, in this project um, through the production of videos um, that felt maybe relevant to them. So I reshared or remembered some of the knowledge that Jennifer Wabano had shared with us. And I also uh, brought their attention to um, Treaty Elders of Saskatchewan, which is a book um, produced by the Treaty Commission um, in Saskatchewan where they convened a series of elders forums and they shared indigenous knowledge um, around treaty making. And I also shared um, some of my knowledge that I've been able to gain over time living here in the BC Anishinaabek territory um, about um, the two row wampum or about um, uh, wampum just generally. So I shared that with them, but my goal really is um, for them to activate that in ways that are meaningful to them, because that's really, um, I think, how knowledge continues is that it's meaningful within the context of the lives that we're living and that we're undertaking and that we're applying that within um, the time that we're in. Mm -hmm. So it's been really fantastic to work alongside them and um, they're using totally different technology than I would <laughs> for my videos and my yeah. projects. And so there's been a lot of learning as well. And they've also been in mentorship um, with some key folks through Trinity Square Video who've, who've been supporting um, their uh, animation projects as well. Yeah, I'm really excited to see their work and your work together in the space and playing around um, with the structural components of video work that I feel is possible. And I, I think that um, to create materiality around uh, this idea of knowledge sharing of Indigenous histories and also this um, sharing of education of treaty creation is uh, will be obvious within the exhibition, but I'm excited that there will be a material component kind of articulating uh, some of that shared and some of that like passed down um, information. Uh, and for the exhibition, um, for those of you who don't know, but you're going to be working on a sculptural and a sculpture uh, titled The Moment and Endurance to, uh, to the End Forever, which is also the title of the exhibition that I mentioned earlier. And it'll be made from coconut scarves uh, using nautical knots that your father uses while fishing uh, near the village where you're from. Uh, which is exciting uh, to know that you're learning how to do some of those knots. Um, can you chat a bit about the material, the scarves in particular, and then also the patterns of the knot and how you find that they're coming together right now? Yeah, so I mentioned earlier I'm from, I'm a Lutuk and I'm from um, southwestern Alaska. So our village is right on the ocean, the Pacific Ocean, and we grow up not only on the land, but also on the water. And when I was a child and a young person, I watched my father, you know, tie marine knots on uh, anchors and crab pots and buoys and, you know, just from the boat to the, the harbor um, thousands and thousands of times. And I was, I was really interested in this sort of repetition as an action that I saw him undertake on a daily basis. And I'm quite clumsy at it. I'm very clumsy at it. I always have been. Um, but there's this like bodily knowledge that he has that um, I don't have, but I certainly have observed over, over many years. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking also about Gokum scarves. I've been interested in them for a while. Um, I've been interested in them in different ways. I mean, partly they sort of signify this, um, anti-knowledge or gukum knowledge, and gukum means uh, grandmother in Cree. And um, they're sort of gesturing towards this kind of durational inheritance um, that we have, and that we're also signifying that we're undertaking, that we're, that we're um, gesturing towards that experience and that knowledge, but that we're also taking that up in our own lives. Mm -hmm. And so I've 
I've seen them in lots of different ways. So I see powwow dancers wearing them as a part of their regalia. My daughter um, wears um, gokum scarves. She's both a jingle dancer and a old style fancy shawl dancer and she uses gokum scarves with her regalia. But both men and women um, use them or wear them with their regalia. And then also um, many people wear them within the context of political movements or marches or you know protests, they're, they're present. And I think that it's gesturing towards this indigenous way of being and knowing that is often connected to the land, but also um, that that's where we find our strength, you know, and that's where we find this um, continuance. So I'm just interested in these generally, but I was thinking about um, this action of, of the tying of the knots and this kind of connection from one generation to the next and this connection to our ancestors, which we can't really know. We don't really know what the lives of our ancestors were like. Um, even my own grandmother, I don't fully know what her life was like um, because she passed away when I was quite young. Mm -hmm. um, so, but even though we can't fully know it, we, we are still in relation to it and we're thinking about it and we're, we're it's active, that's active in our lives. And then it continues, um, you know, from the generations that we do know and, and their experiences and then ourselves and our children. And then again, it continues to the future and that's another space that we can't fully know. Um, and so I think there's something really beautiful about this not knowing and, um, and yet this deep belief in that continuance uh, from one generation to the next. Mm. I'm so excited to see all the works together in the exhibition, uh, which will be installing next week. Um, and just to recognize, as you were saying, this like idea of unknowing, but then knowing too in, in having the generational aspect with your children being part of the exhibition too. So like mm -hmm. having that balance throughout the exhibition um, with moving images, but also with a very strong material element is going to be wonderfully balanced, but also we're going to try and <laughs> we're going to try to avoid the symmetry in the space and to to throw off mm -hmm. those those narratives a little bit to leave to leave that void and that acknowledgement and in, in that void. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for talking to me. Oh, sorry, you're going to say something. <laughs> I was just going to say that Trinity Square Video is, is it's such a beautiful space. And uh, I do have a history there as well. I shot work there in the past with dancers. And so it feels really nice to be sort of um, entering into that space again, even though it's virtual. <laughs> That's a little <laughs> tough. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's something... Um, quite remarkable about that space and the way that the light uh, the light functions although it's tough when we're working with video to fully um, experience the light in that space but it's a quite it's quite remarkable and it's mm -hmm. it's been um, I often think about the site that I'm in as well it's 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 about how does this work uh, work within that space mm -hmm. you know and I think that we've had some really good conversations about that as well. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It all started with the architecture, I feel, mm -hmm. and yeah, your experience with it. So I'm happy that we continue to talk about it. And then also, I guess, to consider this digital architecture that we're also going to be kind of conversating with and, and navigating through. So, so thank you for doing this talk with me and, and I'm looking forward to, yeah, again, seeing the work in the space and seeing you at Imaginative.
I would like to take the opportunity to thank the entire Imaginative team and all of our many volunteers who worked tirelessly to make this event happen. I would also like to acknowledge our board of directors and their contributions. I would like We're to take back. the opportunity to thank the, the entire Imaginative and team and all of our many volunteers who worked tirelessly to make this it's event free happen. And available to I would be also like to acknowledge all you need to sign up is a free pass or and put your email in. Um, and thank you so much for participating in the comments. We had some amazing announcements and I love the artists that were representing the list. Uh, so many of them are also my favorites. Thank you so much. So Claudia, so I think we said we were going to announce some giveaway winners. What do you think? Of course. First off, <laughs> congratulations to Monica Marion and Rose Stiff Arm, who have each won a $500 gift card from Sobeys. Yay! Also selected from among the great comments, the winner of the art book is Percival Hunter. Woo! Congratulations, everyone. So happy for you. And I won some giveaways, but unfortunately, I guess I'm not allowed. <laughs> oh, exciting! <laughs> Just remember to continue to check out the website. Every single day we have announcements. Myself and Naomi are on live at 9.30 every morning, giving you updates of what happened the day before and what is yet to come. So thanks so much for checking us out and we'll talk to you soon.